Hey, what's up, guys? It's your girl, Andrea Griffin Rogers here, and I have a word for you that God gave me today, and um, I'm going to take my time with this message because it's a, it's a touchy subject that uh, we don't hear many people in the church talking about, but it's something that goes on in the world, um, and so God placed it in my heart this morning in a very powerful way, which I'll share with you in a minute. And uh, I didn't know why at the time that he did it, but you know, God has his reasons. And lately I've just been learning how to, well, let me rephrase that. Lately I've been reminded how to just trust God, even when I don't understand why he says something or what's going on. I just need to trust him and show up when he tells me to show up. And that's that. And so um, today's spiritual wellness check in. Um, it is part two of the speak the word Bible devotional that um, that I started last week. Um, but this this one, this one isn't just going to be about reading God's word because uh, there's a word out there for someone that needs to hear this. And so I want to pray before we go into this thing because it's a very touchy subject. And I know that we need the Holy Spirit in this moment to saturate not only the atmosphere, but our hearts to hear and receive what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church. And then I'll give you the title when I uh, finish the prayer. So, Spirit of Living God, we come to you right now. We just want to say thank you for allowing this opportunity for my brothers and my sisters to hear a word from you, God. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. May you get the glory, honor, and praise. May I be decreased in this moment, Heavenly Father, so that you may be increased, Lord Jesus. There are people that are hurting out there, and they need this timely word that you gave me, God. So, Let there be no fears, no nerves, no anxieties as I release this word. Heavenly Father, give me the strength and capacity to get this word out to your people. And Father God, let this word fall on the hearts of those who need to receive it, whether it's them in particular or they know somebody who has went through this experience uh, or similar experience, God, and they need to hear this word. They need to be encouraged. They need to be strengthened. They need to be empowered. They need to be loved on and know that, God, you see them. You were there with them when it happened and you see them. And we can trust in your promise that says vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And so, Father God, we release our need to even try to understand why things happen. We trust God that there is a purpose in every painful experience, every traumatic experience, every tragedy that happens. There is a there is a purpose in the pain, Heavenly Father. And so I pray that you take each person's pain, Lord, and give them beauty for ashes. Take each person's hurt, Lord, and be near to them comforting them, hugging them, strengthening them, pouring love into them, pouring identity back into them, God, so that the condition of what they went through, though that may be fact, it won't be your truth of who they are in you. Let them know who they are in you, Christ Jesus, because there are too many people who have experienced tragedies and they've lost their identity. They've experienced trauma and they don't know who they are anymore, God. And so, Father God, as I release this timely word that you have given me to release in my obedience, Heavenly Father, let even my sacrifice of my truth and the vision you gave me be what the people need to hear. I pray that it doesn't fall on deaf ears, but that it falls on good ground it produces good fruit in the lives of your children that today somebody will hear this message whatever they come across it and they will say enough this message is for me and i'm going to take god's promises i'm going to take god's word i'm going to take what he's saying through andrea and i am going to hold on and trust that god sees me he knows me by name and he will handle those who persecuted me who came against me 
who harmed me in any or mishandled me in any way, shape or form. So this is my prayer, God, that it will fall in the hearts of your children and that there will be compassion that will flow so that even if it's somebody who wants to comment in the comment section, me too, that they will understand that there's no judgment, no shame, no condemnation in Christ Jesus, but there's love. There's joy, there, there's peace, there's identity. There's the strength and endurance they need to journey on. That God, not only did he see that, but he remembers it no more. And that he holds them close because you are near to the brokenhearted. This is my prayer, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So today's title, uh, if, if you haven't already kind of picked up on it, it's called get into position. Get into position. It's time. It's time. I know some of you have went through some challenges in your life. You've experienced some traumas in your life. COVID-19 was hard on your life. You went through some abuse in your life. Physical, sexual, emotional, mental even spiritual abuse. Some of you have church hurt, but God is saying it's time to heal. It's time to mend. It's time to strengthen. And it's time to get back into the game because he wants you to get into position. Because as I'll release the rest of this word and we'll get into the scripture text um, of 1 Kings 19, that's our first one we're going to start with. You have to understand that even with what you're going through, Somebody needs your story. Somebody needs to hear that you made it out. You made it out alive. That you may have some scars. You may have some wounds. But that God healed those wounds. They have to hear your testimony. Because there's somebody that's even wishing right now where you are. To get to the place where you are. They need to hear your story. In whatever way that is. Not everybody's going to write a book, but some of you may write a song, write a play or a movie. You may share your story through your baking or your cooking and somebody may ask you, wow, how can you pour your love in in this way? And then it'll be in that moment where you'll share what you've experienced. It could be through your fashion or through your service as um, and I don't know if you guys can hear that, but excuse the noise. We're not going to let any. Uh, construction get in the way of this word being released amen um but you know it w even if you're a nurse or a doctor or a lawyer wherever you're serving wherever god's telling you to show up at if you're a janitorial janitorial worker um editorial worker wherever you are understanding that in that moment when you feel something pulling on your heart to share your story share it it could be a moment where somebody, a stranger, just comes up to you and or you walk by somebody and you just feel a, something on your heart that says, I got to stop and speak to them. I see them crying or I see they look so sad or angry or frustrated and something in you will say, let me just ask, are you OK? How you doing today? And you may get them pouring out in that moment. And that'll be your opportunity to share your story. Don't worry about if somebody's going to judge you for it. God is the final say. He is the ultimate judge. So it doesn't matter what anybody else has to say about your story. You survived it. You got through it. Not by your own strength, but by God's strength. By the grace and mercy of God, you got through it. Because there's some people who didn't make it through. There's some people who died going through that thing. There's some people who came up, up against that challenge and shattered because of it. They, they just couldn't even handle it anymore. But you got through so that somebody can see the good news of Jesus Christ through your life. And so I know some of you will be like, well, Andrea, you said this message is kind of a touchy subject, but you called it get into position. How is it? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to tell you in a second. Um, I'm going to start with a scripture first because it ties into what I just said. And then I'll go into further of a prophetic vision um, that God gave me 
Um, and and I'll share with you my own personal story about that matter. So First Kings 19, starting at the first verse, many of you may have heard or been familiar with this text. If you've um, been in the church before, church culture, uh, you've read your Bible before, so you may be familiar with this. And there's some of you that may have never heard this story before. And so I'm going to read it to you so that you'll hear it. Uh, when Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he killed all the prophets of Baal. If you go back, pausing really quickly to the previous chapter of 1 Kings 18, then you see that um, the prophet Elijah causes all of um, the Israelites to come together. And he kind of gets on them about something that God put in his heart because God noticed that they weren't uh serving or worshiping god they were serving worshiping false idols uh called baal and so they were praying and giving sacrifices and even cutting themselves and killing their children to this false idol this false deity this false god and saying that this was the way and god's like i, I would have never required you to kill your children why would i tell you to sacrifice something like that and we know even if we think back to abraham and isaac and the in genesis jesus or rather god spared abraham's hand and said do not harm the boy it was just a matter of test to see will you really truly serve me but he never had him go forward in killing his own son and so these people are doing just detestable things in God's eyes. And so he sends the prophet Elijah to um, basically show that he is the true God. And so he, you know, they dig a ditch and they sacrifice a, um, several bulls. And so the prophets of the false deity, Baal, um, they, you know, pray and do all these different sacrificial things to try and get the um sacrifice kind of like burnt up because the uh because what elijah says is uh whoever whichever god responds and takes the sacrifice or burns up the sacrifice is the one true god we whatever god we see moves in this way immediately is the one true god and so the prophets of baal are like praying and just doing all these crazy things and the bull uh for them isn't um burnt up and so then uh, Elijah says, let's ignore that notification. <laughs> then Elijah says, okay, well, I'm going to pray to the one true God. And so he's chops up the bull. He sets up an altar of 12 stones and, um, he prays to God and said, God, you know, show your true power. And then God sends fire immediately down, burns up the sacrifice. And the Israelites see that this is the true God and they repent of their sins. And then Elijah tells them, okay, now go and kill those false prophets. And so this is where we pick up at where King Ahab, who was actually there, by the way, when this happened. Um, but he goes back to his wife, who is, you might have heard this name, Jezebel before, who is Jezebel and uh she's an evil spirit in her and so she is very furious to hear because these were her gods and so she's very furious to hear that the prophets of her false god was killed so here we you know pick back up in the second verse so jezebel sent this message to elijah may the god strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow i have not killed you just as you killed them Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judea, and he left his servant there, or Judah, and left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, get up and eat some more or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank and the food the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. 
And this is where Moses got the Ten Commandments, by the way. So that might be familiar to some of you. It's like, that sounds familiar. Then he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Go out before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Then the Lord told him, go back the same way you came, and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hazael to be king of Aram, then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, to be the king of Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from the town of Ab Abel Meholah, to replace you as my prophet. Anyone who escapes from Hazael will be killed by Jehu, and those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. So Elijah went and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, plowing a field. There were 12 teams of oxen in the field, and Elisha was plowing with the 12th team. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak across his shoulders and then walked away. Elisha left the oxen standing there, ran after Elijah, and said to him, First, let me go kiss my father and mother goodbye, and then I will go with you. Elijah replied, Go on back, but think about what I have done to you. So Elisha returned to his oxen and slaughtered them. He used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. He passed around the meat to the townspeople and they all ate. Then he went with Elijah as his assistant. So I have a few more scriptures I want to get to, but I want to tell you why God gave me this word today. It's because he gave me a vision first. Um, in the vision... I saw a, um, in the vision, I saw a, this, the, the construction, but we're not going to let no distraction stop us in Jesus name. Anyway, in the vision, I saw the most horrendous act I've ever seen. And it's something that I've experienced myself. And I saw rape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so this is a topic that most people in the church don't want to talk about but there are a lot of people out here who have been raped before and they need the church they need to know that God cares about them and many times they don't have nowhere to go because there's a shame there's a guilt there's a stigma attached to it that says I'm dirty nobody could want me I've been mishandled abused mistreated so all I'm going to get is judgment. So I can't tell my story. And so in this particular vision, um, it starts off with me seeing as if like I'm watching. A lot of times I see visions um, as a movie. And so I'm kind of like watching this played out, even though I feel like I'm there, but I'm not there. And I'm just kind of watching this played out. And so I see a group of women and they go... Um, they go to they go to Brazil and as they're visiting Brazil like on a girl's trip and this is nothing against any particular country this is just what God showed me in the vision so really quickly um and so they go to a girl's trip in Brazil and while they're there some um they're meeting up with a particular friend who had a really nice uh luxury hotel suite and so some of the girls didn't stay at the same hotel 
And so they're going, there are different ways. One girl got to run a car. The other girl decided to take like an Uber or a taxi. And she goes into the car. And as she gets into the taxi, um, she uh, tells the driver where she's going. The driver pulls off. Next thing you know, they're on a highway. And in the middle of the highway, it's like backed up traffic. Now, when she told the driver where she was going, she also told them the time she needed to get there by. So the driver uh, recognized the time and says like, oh, you know, backs up in the middle of the highway. And she's like frantic because she's on her phone at first, just looking down, not paying attention, as most of us do when we get into an Uber or a taxi. And so you just, you know, figure that the person driving you will get you to your destination safe and sound and in one piece. So this is another uh, disclaimer real quick or for somebody that you got to pay attention when you get in a car you cannot just be so distracted on your phone that you are not paying attention to your environment and so anyway so this woman when he backs up he backs up really fast and this is when like she's jolted in a car seat and so she's like oh and she puts her phone down she sees what's going on and she's like wait a minute, what are you doing like what where are you going and so then she recognizes that there are other cars doing the same thing because the traffic seems to be at a standstill. And so she figures, well, this must be what they do in this country. So, okay, he must know what he's doing. And so he's like, you know, I know a different way. She's like, okay, fine. He takes a different way. Um, and as he goes to the other side of the highway, kind of like doing a U-turn, he crashes. Um, his bumper crashes into like the tail of another car, but he keeps going. And she's like confused. What? Why didn't you just stop? Why are you keep going? And he's like, oh, well, because it's going to come out your bill. So it has nothing to do with me. And she's like, uh, I'm not paying for that. <laughs> like, I know, like, how ridiculous somebody would say that. And so in the vision, she's like, I'm not paying for that. Um, no, you that's not coming up my bill at all. Like, you could just, um, you know, drop me off. And so he continues driving. And he's speeding up. And she notices that she suddenly feels really uncomfortable in this car like the way that this man not only spoke to her but then the way he laughed made her feel very sinister right now and so she sees that it's an old school type of car or i won't say old school i mean old school in the sense of our modern cars where everything's automatic this is a car probably i would say pre-2000s where uh you have to manually some people don't, some people don't know that but I grew up in a time where you had to manually lock the car, each uh, side of the car door. You couldn't just push a button and all the doors locked or push a button on the side of the driver's seat and all the doors locked. And so he's like, le like reaching his arm back to lock the door so that she can't get out. And her realizing this, because at first she was trying to put up a strategy of like, well, when he tries to slow down a bit, um, maybe at a light or something, I'll jump out. But her realizing that he's trying to lock her in the car, she says, oh, I have to get out. Like, I cannot get stuck here. And because she's aware of human trafficking, she's like, oh, no. And so she jumps out of the car. Uh, she moves his hand, opens the car door, jumps out the car. And, and thank God that she makes it safely on the, on the car. But he stops the car. So she just starts running, afraid, frantically running. And for those that are trying to like figure out, is this a black person, white person? It's actually a white person. So it, even though race should not be involved in this moment, but it's a white person that is being attacked, a white woman. And so she's running and she's afraid and she's screaming out to the other Brazilians, help somebody help me. This person is trying to um, abduct me. Please help me. Please help me. And you know, the saddest thing is many people are just looking at her. They're just staring, not willing to help. And she's confused because she knows that, you know, in America, if she screams, everybody stopping what they don't want to come see about this white woman and see what's wrong. But in this other country, she's not getting any responses whatsoever. And so she's frantic and she's trying to figure out why aren't they stopping to help me out? You know, and she's like, well, back at home, people will help me. So she's like, well, you know what? I'll call the cops. Because the driver is trying to chase her down. The abductor is trying to chase her down while she's running. And so she takes out her phone and she's trying to dial 911. And even though she's in another country, she hopes that somehow by dialing 911, it will route her because it's an iPhone. It will route her to the local police. And so um, then the, the, the scene shifts and... Um, and somehow she makes it 
what I what I first thought in the dream was home, but it's not really home. And she's on the phone with the police, and she's telling them the police of Brazil, telling them like what happened to her and how because she jumped out really quickly, she left her bag in the car, and it had like a huge sum of money in the car, like um, it had I think she about four hundred fifty thousand dollars in the car, and in her bag, and so. And so you may be like, what's she doing with that in her bag? I'll get to that in a minute. But in the car, she left her bag in the car. And so she's like, um, I, you know, can you find out who did it? And then is there a way to get my money back? And unfortunately, she's being judged. Now, there's a female cop who's helping her first. And she's not judging her. She's sympathetic because she understands. She's also aware of human trafficking. And so she's like, you dodged a bullet. I'm so glad you got out alive. But she goes to her superior, who's a male officer excuse me and the male officer is judging her and like well she's she's you know are you crazy like there's thousands of taxis in in this country alone like there's no way i'm going to be able to find who this person is if she can't give me any identification or nothing and then he's like well she probably robbed the bank because who would be driving around or walking around with four hundred fifty thousand dollars in their bag and so the woman as if she can like hear as if she was placed on speakerphone she says well, um, it was actually my inheritance from my grandmother who passed away. And so I was taking this trip, um, you know, as like a promise I had said to my grandma or whatever. And so then now this makes the male officer have a little bit of sympathy because he's like, oh, he understands. He's like, yeah, you know, I lost my, my mamiya too. And so I'm so sorry for your loss. You know, we'll do everything we can to try to find and, and get your money back. I'll talk to the, um, my superintendents or officials or whatnot to see like what we can do to try and get you your, um, your inheritance back. And so, um, next thing the scene changes and this woman is like, back in brazil so to speak or that's why i said i don't know if she was like if she ever left it was she was in like an apartment building at one point so she wasn't in the hotel anymore and so then she meets up with a, a brazilian friend and she's like you know i don't think the cops are gonna do anything about it i'm gonna go and search myself and so the friend is like listen you're not from around here and so you can't just go and try to search for this man on your own you dodge the bullet like please por favor please just take it as um you know a, a win that at least your life was saved and so she's like no um i'm gonna go and so the friend goes with her and she and they somehow find the location of where this man was staying and they go into the room and the friend's supposed to be the lookout and while she's trying to search for if to see if he brought her bag into his apartment um all of a sudden her phone rings and it's the man who seems to have never stopped following her and he's like oh you're in my apartment like i'm going to kill you and so he tries to break down the door and her and her friend are trying to look for exit points and there's two windows uh and they're very narrow but they have black bars like um gates on the window and metal hard metal bars and she can't like figure out how to unlock the mechanism to get out of the window. And so she goes to the other window. And so the friend says, no, wait, come back. Cause she's from Port from Brazil. And so she says, no, wait, come back. There's the, the bars work this way. And so she shows her how to do it. And then they get the bars open they get the windows up. And it's there. They, it's enough space for them to get the room to get to the, um, outdoor balcony or, um, outdoor terrace or whatever, so that they can like try to, get get down to the ground level and so the one friend now even though this woman is the one who initiated it she says to the friend um go ahead uh, i do know the woman's name was tatiana who um this happened to who um was the person trying to be abdu abducted and so she says to, the, to her friend just go ahead and get out um and I, i'm right behind you so she lets her friend out first and then before you know it the um enemy the person the abductor breaks down the door and he grabs a hold of her ankle and the friend is like kicking and screaming the top of her lungs and she manages to get free 
Um, and as the other friend is trying to fight off, as Tatiana Rand is trying to fight off the abductor, he like hits her so hard and knocks her onto the floor. So the friend gets away. She shimmies down the pole. Uh, the, the, not the pole, the, uh, what do you call it? Like the pipes that's on the outside of houses. She shimmies down that and, um, she gets to the ground level and she's like trying to look for help. And she looks behind her to see if her friend was behind her. She realizes the friend isn't. And so she has a dilemma. Do I go back and get my friend who I know is probably happening to her? Or do I try to go get help because I know I can't do it in my own strength? And so she realized that she can't do it by herself. If she doesn't go get help, then they both will be in it, stuck in a situation. So she goes and gets help. She calls the police officer who Tatiana was talking to earlier about it. And she says, you know, uh, basically explains what's going on. Says that like she's going to need help. But she's leaving like a voicemail because the detective didn't answer the phone at the time. And so he, as soon as she finishes a message, he's actually listening to the voicemail. And he grabs his coat and he's on his way. It The scene then goes back to the woman, uh, Tatiana. And she is on the floor, crouching her knees to her chest, sitting up. And she's just feeling so sad and so defeated but there's something in her heart that begins to sing a song and the song was um uh by donnie mcclurkin who's a gospel artist and it's called caribbean medley and she starts singing this song um about how she um is going to see her jesus someday and it's just encouraging her and she tries to um have her faith pour out onto this young man because now it's revealed uh now that she could see him that he actually in in person that this is a young man he, he has to be about maybe 18 19 20 no more than 21 years old and yet this is the life he's living and so she's trying to evangelize as it's called in the church to him and she's singing the song to him and she's trying to get him into singing the song and as i'm like seeing this happening to her I can also tell that he's pretending to sing with her, but he's not really mouthing it. And she thinks she hears him singing because she hears singing her heart, not realizing that it's the Holy Spirit singing the song in her heart. And as I'm looking, I'm like, I wish I could scream out to her to tell her what's about to happen. And sure enough, what happens is the man, uh, it's like he has a, like a watch on that has like a gas in it. And he like pushes the button and releases a gas that kind of knocks her out. Um, like I've like I've seen on movies that Chlor I think it's called chlorophyll does when they put it on somebody's face and it knocks her out and she passes out. The man takes her clothes off and rapes her. And as she, you know, is awakened by this pressure and this pain and this agony of this horrible man on top of her. She wants to scream, but she can't because his tongue is in her mouth. And so you just hear like this mm, from her. And I remember um, as I woke up, God gave me the option. He said, you can either write it down or you can't. But I remember I felt so numb in that moment trying to figure out, God, why would you show me a woman being attacked in this way? And then I remembered I was once raped. And it's, and it's not like I forgot it. It's that... Uh, it happened. I, I had healed from it and, and then I moved on. And so in that moment, I remembered feeling just like that woman felt and wishing that somebody heard my screams to come and help me. And nobody did. And as I lay there crying, I heard the Holy Spirit sing a song to me. And it was a song by Kirk Franklin um, called... Uh, Kirk Franklin and Richard Smallwood called don't cry and the words I heard was why do you cry he has risen why are you weeping he's not dead he paid it all on that lonely highway and his anointing I can feel and as I heard those songs I continued to cry but I started to feel a little bit better and then I asked God well why did you show me that? Why? Why, God? Why? Where were you when that happened to me? 
And God's spirit said, I was right there. I saw what happened to you. I saw what that horrible man did to you. I even saw another memory he brought back to me. He said, I even saw what that older gentleman did to you in California, your former boss, when he sexually assaulted you and took advantage of you. I saw every time somebody mishandled you or mistreated you. I saw when they forced themselves on you. I saw it. And the Lord said, vengeance is mine. He said, you've healed. But now you got to tell the story. You got to get into position. Because somebody has to hear this story to see that somebody made it out. And somebody has been strengthened and healed by God's Holy Spirit. If you're a woman out there. And it's not to say that there aren't men that are raped, but sex trafficking is really strong and predominantly with women around the world. If you're a woman out there, I want you to know that God sees you. He knows you by name, just as he saw me and he knew me by name. And he says to you, as he said to me today, a reminder of his word, a promise that is in Deuteronomy uh, 32, chapter 32, verse 35, and also reiterated in Romans 12, 19 to 21. And I'll read those scriptures in a minute, but it says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. We don't have to worry about when somebody does something to us trying to get them back. I know there's thousands of movies out there um, where you see women have had enough and they go and they take the law into their own hands. But God says, you never know, just as in the vision, you never know what worse you're getting yourself into when you try to take it into your hands. When you try to seek revenge in your hands, you have got to trust that your heavenly father is going to jump up in this thing. And you may say, well, where were you then? God, why didn't you keep it from happening then? And I'm reminded of John 16, 33, where he says, I have told you all of this so that you may have peace in me here on earth. You will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. That means take belief, take your solace, take your peace in him because he's overcome the world. I remember uh, before I get to the scriptures to read to you, I remember a story that I read uh, last year, um, a book called um, called AD 30. And I remember when I got when I read it, it, I didn't go seeking this book. It's a book by an author named Ted Decker. And I remember when I went um to read this book i wasn't seeking it i was i didn't know nothing, nothing about ted decker i never heard of this man before but god spoke it to me in a vision and all i heard was um ad 30 or rather excuse me i heard decker 30 and i said well, there's no book in the bible named decker 30 so what are you talking about god and when i woke up i wrote the vision down and then i prayed about it and then i said god i don't understand you know, I'm almost certain I even went to the Catholic Bible and I said, I'm, I, there is no book in the Bible named Decker 30. And he said, Google it. And so I went and Google it. And sure enough, a author came up named Ted Decker and a book called 8030. And I read the book and I read the book of a story named Mavaya. And Mavaya went through so many tragedies in her life, just as I have, just as many of you may have been through as well. She's seen her child murdered in front of her. She had been taken advantage of sexually. She had been abused. She had been enslaved. She had been, uh, she saw her father killed. I mean, she just went through so much in a world and society where she was seen as nothing. And yet you see the end of her story where she has an encounter with Jesus that changes her life, that reminds her just as, uh, dare I say, the woman in the, the vision that says, the Lord is always with you. There, there's a song in your heart. If you just keep your eyes and your mind and your heart focused on Jesus, you can get through anything. 
And I know that's, that may sound easier said than done. Because when I first was raped, this was in college, I didn't tell anybody. And so there may be some family members or friends that may watch this and may be very shocked to hear my truth. Because I have never shared this. Just like I didn't share what happened to me, but to my spiritual mentor, um, I didn't share what happened to me in California. And so many of my family members don't know, you know, and I was judged very harshly for some of the things I've went through in my life, but that's because they didn't know my story. And some of you may be out there as well, having going through judgment and ridicule and people not understanding your brokenness or not understanding your grief and wondering why are you uh, the way you are, whether you're a bitter person or, or a hateful person or a closed up recluse, or you're just a sad person, emotional roller coaster, because I've been called that before in my lifetime, whatever it is, people don't know your story. And, and, and that's okay right now, but there comes a time where God says you have to heal from your story and then you got to get in position to tell your story because somebody needs the testimony. Somebody needs to hear that there's life on the other side of this pain. Agents of Revival, I say it all the time. If you've been following my ministry, my podcast, uh, which is streaming on all platforms, it started with me first. God had to revive me. He had to revive my identity. He had to revive my purpose. He had to revive um just who I was, the child of his, he had to revive and restore the dreams and goals I had inside of my heart before the tragedies and the traumas and the heartaches and the pains came along. There was some dreams stored up in me that when those things, incidences took place, they died in me and I'd given up believing that it's never going to happen because of these tragedies that happened to me. But God is a God of restoration. And I'm so glad that Jesus said, if I didn't allow you to be destroyed or to die in that, it's because I have a purpose and a plan for your life. I understand that there are other people that that ended their life. But God says, I have a purpose for yours. You have to not only own what you've went through, but forgive yourself. And there may be some people out there that this never happened to you. So you don't understand what I'm saying with this. But give compassion to those that's happened for. Because for those out there that's like me and it's happened to you where you were raped, you were mishandled, you were sexually abused or assaulted. Understand that um, it's not your fault. Many of us feel like, well, if I would have just did this differently, if I would have just did that differently, if I would have thought this or thought that. And many times it's not your fault. You don't have control over what somebody else does. There's an evil spirit in them that makes them do what they do. You only have control over yourself. And so in that, you've got to just be focused on you. Forgive you first. Then when you get to the point of forgiveness in yourself first, then you could eventually get forgive that person. Though I have no idea what happened to my former boss. I do know. Well, I know a little bit. I, I know that I heard uh, he had gotten cancer. And, and this is not for those that's like, well, I have cancer. This is nothing to do with you. I'm talking about my former boss. I know he had gotten cancer. I don't know if he, you know, succumbed to it or not. Uh, I do know I did hear that he got cancer. Um, and and then for the person who raped me in college, uh, God actually allowed me to see a little bit of his vengeance in that person because that person at the time had a very high position uh, of power uh, at a particular, um, you know, corporate place. And I remember um, I saw them years later and their life, I mean, they, they had dropped down significantly. They were um, working a job that I would say, if you ask them in that season when they raped me, they probably would have said it was beneath them. They thought they were so high and mighty and God like, brought them down. I don't know what else happened in their life. I didn't even stay to ask any questions. I just so happened to be in a place where they were and I saw them. And they saw me too. And it was almost as if they were they were looking for me to acknowledge them or just to offer forgiveness or something. And I didn't give them anything. 
and part of it, I'm going to be honest, was the anxiousness in me of being confronted with my abuser and, and trying to figure out how do I even deal with this person who raped me? And I had to just keep praying my strength so that I wouldn't break down in that moment or so that I wouldn't lash out or cause a scene. And, and I left and I just had a moment. Thank God it was a sunny day. I just kind of took a moment sitting in my car to just take a few deep breaths in. And I put some Christian music on to just, you know, settle my spirit. And I just thank God that I survived. I survived. Even in that moment of facing my abuser in a place that I didn't expect him to be. I still survived. He didn't attack me again. Thank you, Jesus. And so, um, for those who have never been through it, give grace, extend kindness to someone who is going through it. Understand those that have been through it. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. I want to read this scripture to you. I'm going to start at Romans 12. Like I said, um, Romans 12, starting at the, let me get my scripture. So I got the 19th verse and it reads, I'm reading from New Living Translation, by the way. And it reads, dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. You got to understand that even if somebody takes something from you, like in the vision, you know, the first part of it where the money was taken from her, let it go. Because as she saw by her vengeance to want to get it back and get it done herself, she found herself in a deeper trap than the first part. And in this situation, she didn't get out. Her friend got out, but she didn't get out. Don't let yourself be consumed by vengeance, by revenge, by the bitterness of trying to get back the person who hurt you. Because it's like poison, you drinking the poison and hoping the other person die. You're the one drinking the poison. But follow God's word. Again, I know it may sound easier said than done, but I've been through it. I went through it. And I've prayed for the people who have harmed me. I've prayed for my abusers. I've prayed for those who mishandled me. I've prayed for those. I've been robbed before too. And not robbed where they, you know, stuck me up. But like my car was vandalized and robbed. And there were valuables taken out of it. And I prayed. Instead of calling the cops, instead of seeking vengeance, instead of going after that person myself, I even got confronted again because the Holy Spirit will speak to you and show you who's talking about you, who has uh, ill will towards you. You know, just like in the vision, you know, the girl suddenly felt this inkling of like, this is not a safe car for me to be in. I need to get out of this car. How does she know that? It's because of the Holy Spirit, because knowledge, wisdom comes from the Holy Spirit. Revelation comes from the Holy Spirit. So though she didn't audibly hear the Holy Spirit say, this is a bad person, there was a, a sense of a feeling in the pit of her stomach that said, I got to get out of here. And so she got out of it. And so, um, you know, why am I telling you this? First of all, because God wanted me to. This is a word for somebody out there, but it was a message I never wanted to teach. I'm going to be honest. It was, it's not that I was running away from my past because like I told you, God confirmed in me that you've healed from this. It was just a thing that I healed from and didn't want to go back to. But I believe God is speaking through me today to someone out there that says, you may have healed from that thing, whatever that thing is. It may not be exactly rape or, mal or molestation or um, sexual misconduct or or sexual trafficking. It may not be those things. But there's something in you that you've healed from. And God says I need you to get into position. I need you to speak about it now. 
because somebody needs to hear your story. Somebody needs to see your walk of life to see, wow, you went through that and yet you could still smile and yet you could still serve others and yet you could still be helpful to others and yet you could still have love in your heart and yet you, it didn't end your life. You overcame how and you could say because of the goodness and grace and mercy of the lord because that's how i overcame even when i was talking to god about teaching this message i had to shed some tears because i said god this is something i really don't want to do but in my obedience i had to believe that my sacrifice to share my story would encourage and strengthen you out there that will come upon this message. If you're feeling tears in your eyes, let them fall. Understand that the tears that we shed will water the garden of blessings and miracles and fruitfulness that God has in our life. Even if you don't see that fruitfulness today, trust that God says, I will pay back every evil that was done in your life. And he says in another scripture, he says, I will give you beauty for ashes. You just got to trust in the father, even when you can't trace him. When I was going through those experiences, I couldn't trace where God was. It seemed like God would, could not be in this position. Why would God be in this room with this horrible situation happening to me? Why would God be in this house uh, with these houses rather where, where my boss took advantage of me or, and where you know, this, um, this, this man, um, from this fraternity took it to, you know, sexually rape me and assault me. Why, why would God, how could God be there? That was years ago. I graduated in 2010. Now it didn't happen in 2010. I want to say it happened in like 2008 or 2009. Years later, here I am 2023 being able to talk about it because God healed me from that pain, from that wound. I want to read Psalms 34 to you. It's a scripture that I've studied many times before, and it wasn't until today that it struck differently for me. Because if you've been following my my uh, podcast or my ministry, then you know that I talk about my Job wilderness season and, and, um, and what I went through and how I entered into that Job wilderness season from a death in my family and so um I thought that this scripture talked about that point and it wasn't until today that God gave me a different perspective and so starting at the 18th verse of Psalms 34 it says the Lord is close to the brokenhearted he rescues those whose spirits are crushed The righteous person faces many troubles, but the Lord comes to the rescue each time. For the Lord protects the bones of the righteous. Not one of them is broken. Calamity will surely destroy the wicked and those who hate the righteous will be punished. But the Lord will redeem those who serve him. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. I don't care if the world around you may judge you. Understand that God sees you as righteous. God loves you. God knows you by name. And God says, my child, I will pay back every evil that was done in your life. I've seen God sometimes strike down people who struck me so quick. They probably haven't even put the correlation together that what's happening to them is because of how they treated me. But God knows. God sees all. He hears all. So you can trust in your father that is going to handle your light work. That is going to make vengeance his own. He's going to pay them back. And so before I go and wrap this up, I want to read this story to you really quickly. Um, because I it gave me a different perspective as well for the abuser and i know you may say well why would god even give you a different perspective for the abuser i'll i'll read this to you and then i'll tell you why it says 
it, it starts with the scripture Luke 18 verse 17 and it reads assuredly I say to you whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it and the title of this uh, short message is called mother's anchor Henry Ward Beecher, considered by many to be one of the most effective and powerful pulpit orators in the history of the United States, not only had a reputation for having an extremely sensitive heart, but also for having a great love of the sea. Many of his sermons were laced with loving anecdotes with a seafaring flavor. Beecher once said, children are the hands by which we take hold of heaven. And he had this to say about a mother's relationship with her child. A babe is a mother's anchor. She cannot swing far from her moorings. And yet a true mother never lives so little in the present as when by the side of the cradle. Her thoughts follow the imagined future of her child. That babe is the boldest of pilots and guides her fearless thoughts down through scenes of coming years. The old ark never made such voyages as the cradle daily makes. When a wonderful image what a wonderful image to think of a child as being on a voyage from heaven through life to return to heaven's port one day. What a challenge to think that our children have not come along to join us in our sailing through life, but we are to join in their voyage. The most valuable gift you can give another is a good example. The reason why I wanted to read this about abusers is because many times the abusers were once abused. Yep. They didn't have anybody to show them the righteous way of living. Show them God's way of living. They didn't have anybody to give them a good example of living. And this is something that God has helped me to understand through my own life from my childhood of being abused to my adulthood of dealing with sexual abuse my childhood was physical abuse and emotional abuse from family and you know in particular um from parents and then onward and onward and so it's a conscious choice for the adult to say i'm going to get healed and I'm not going to let what happened in my past be what I pour out onto others. I'm the cycle. The, the uh, generational curse stops with me. Yes, I may have been abused. Yes, I may have suffered this. But I will not allow it to go any further than me. I will treat my children differently. I will treat all children differently. I will pour unto others. I will have relationships differently because I will not allow what I've been through to taint and bitter the waters that I use to um, pour into other people. I won't do that. You have got to take accountability for your own healing. And understand that though this person hurt you, though they abused you, though they mistreated you, though they um, assaulted you, vengeance is the Lord's. It didn't start with them. We are all in our adulthood like trees. But a tree started as a seed first, planted in the ground. And then it produced roots. And that root is what gave it nutrient to grow up into a tree. And so you have good trees and you have bad trees. A bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree produces good fruit. Hear me out. Understand what God is saying, what the spirit of the Lord is saying to you today. Many of you are harboring this pain in your heart and you got to forgive. You've got to forgive. I was watching a message from um, Pastor Christine Kane today uh, right after I got the vision and God sent me to two, well, actually three messages by her. And one was called Embrace Your Place that she taught at Elevation Church. Um, the other one was called Human Trafficking that she spoke to on her spiritual mentor, Joyce Myers page. And then the other was called Internal Reset that she spoke at a church called Oasis. And I remember as I was asking God, you know, early, like I said, why did you allow me to see this vision? God gave me the name Christine Kane and the number seven. And for those that don't know, seven in the Bible means completion. 
And so I went on YouTube and I was searching for Christine Kane and I just kept hearing echo seven, 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 look for seven years, seven years. And so this is where I found these messages of embrace your place, human trafficking and internal reset, because it was, you know, seven years ago that she taught this message. And for those that don't know Christine Kane, please go Google her. She does amazing work with human uh, sex trafficking with her A21, um, A21 ministry. Um, and so I knew about her ministry, which is why I was like, okay, you know, I know what I'm going into when I listen to her story. And so one of the things that she was saying through these messages was people are hurting in these experiences. Excuse me. And one of the questions that they ask, especially the, the women that she rescues, they ask, where were you before? Are you really here to rescue me? And she says, yes. And they say, well, where were you before? Why didn't you come sooner? And her response was, I don't know why, but I'm here now. And I promise you that I will continue to come after all the other women that I need to come after. I'm saying that today because, like I said, today's message was about getting to position. There are people, whatever your story is, like I said, it may not be exactly this. But whatever your story is, there's people that are waiting for you to get into position. They need your testimony. They need your story. That They need your ministry. They need your ministry is your story. It's what you've been through and how God has helped you get through. How God helped you survive through the pain and the suffering. How God healed your broken heart. How God mended those areas of your body that were attacked. And how God gave you identity in him and gave you a sense of belonging in Christ Jesus. They need your story. You've got to get in position. No longer can you wait. Whatever idea God gave you, whatever business idea God gave you, whatever ministry God gave you, whatever nonprofit organization God gave you, whatever book he told you to write, whatever play he told you to write, whatever um, movie he told you to, to direct and produce, whatever it is that God placed in your heart to do on this earth, you've got to do it. Because there's somebody waiting for you to get into position. They need your story. They need your anointing. They need your oil to be poured onto them because they're so empty and depleted. And they feel like Jesus forgot them. And, and Jesus said, I didn't come for those who are righteous and, and who think they're healthy and are not in need of a savior. I came for those who are sick and know that they are in need of a savior. There are people out there that need to know about your savior. Get into position today. You cannot wait any longer. And remember, as you're out there doing your part, but also as you're out there forgiving those who hurt you, who persecuted you, who harmed you, who mistreated you, who mishandled you, it started with a seed first. They were not born this way. Yes, we're all born into sin, but they were not born this way. But a seed was planted into them. Uh, they were misused. They were abused. They were hurt. They were harmed in some way, shape, or form. And so even though you may want to extend revenge to them, extend grace. Extend forgiveness. Because in doing that, extending mercy, you heap burning coals on their head. And you allow the vengeance to be the Lord's. And so I normally give you a priestly blessing today um, from um, Numbers chapter 6. But today God told me to read Psalms 91 as your prayer as we go. And so here's your prayer as we leave. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This is Psalms 91, New Living Translation. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God and I trust him. He, for he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor the arrows that flies in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, though ten thousand are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. 
Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the most high your shelter, no evil will conquer you. That means no evil will kill you. No evil will defeat you. No plague will come near your home. For he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. You will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. Let God's promises in this scripture, in this word, in this sermon message, in this devotional series, fill your heart with the love and peace that you need, knowing that he is close to the brokenhearted. He sees your pain. He will mend your wounds. He will heal your suffering. He will give you beauty for ashes. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord our God be gracious to you. Show you his favor and give his shalom. Give his peace. Take care. Bye now.